We talked briefly about the difference between alternating current and direct current in an earlier video. We're going to formalize it here. So when charge flows, when current flows through a circuit, there are two big ways it can do it. You can either have a constant flow in a single direction of current, which we call direct current. So think of it like water in a tube where the water is constantly flowing in the same direction. Or you can have the current oscillating back and forth called alternating current, where the flow of electric charge periodically changes direction. So an example of this, an analogy that might help, is for direct current, imagine a bandsaw or a chainsaw cutting a log. As the chainsaw goes down, the chain is always going in the same direction as it cuts through that side of the chainsaw, always goes in the same direction as it cuts through the log. Whereas in the old days, right, the large saws, the two-man saws, you'd have to saw back and forth, back and forth, back and forth as the saw went down through the tree. It's a similar analogy. So direct current, current is always flowing in the same direction at the same potential. Alternating current, the current is flowing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So one, direct current, batteries, electronic devices, cell phones, laptops, that, those sorts of things typically operate on direct current. Alternating current, your household, and a lot of lamps, your electric stove, dishwasher, refrigerator, those types of things operate using alt, uh, alternating current. So direct current is often referred to as DC current. Alternating current is referred to as AC. So what it would look like in terms of voltage over time? So voltage, it's not really voltage, right? It's potential. It's measured in volts. So when I talk about the voltage of something, I'm really talking about the potential and the units are volts, although your book starts talking about voltages. So it's the potential as a function of time. So in a direct current circuit, the potential stays flat, right? When you power your laptop with its battery, or as long as you're not you know, changing what you're doing and drawing different amounts of power, um, a simple DC light bulb or uh, an LED bulb, which is typically a DC light bulb, the current flows in a single direction at a constant potential. In alternating current, the potential changes with time. It goes through zero, right? So that line is zero. The potential is positive, and then it goes back to negative. Then it goes to positive, then it goes to negative. And it goes to some maximum and minimum potential. The maximum and minimum are potential, we'll call V naught and negative V naught, assuming there's symmetry there, and changes with time. So the most common form of alternating current is sinusoidal. It is this wave pattern, although you can do other types of alternating current. You do a box wave, something like that. But those are typically used in everyday life. So we'll talk about the sinusoidal, the blue wavy line here. If there's an alternating current power source in your circuit, it will be drawn with this symbol here, a circle with a sine wave or cosine wave inside. So that means that it's a sinusoidal power source. This function, the blue curve here, is similar to the wave motion we learned about last semester. When we talked about sound, and we talked about how sound travels as a pressure wave, but we also talked about waves, transverse waves on string. We'll talk about waves in more detail when we talk about light later on this semester. But going back to simple harmonic motions and wave motion last semester, the equation that represents this blue wave is shown here. The potential at any time t is equal to some maximum potential, right? How high does it get its maximum value? That doesn't change with time times this sinusoidal function, this sine wave, equals 2 pi times the frequency of the oscillation. Now in the US, frequency is typically 60 hertz. So the 
wave, you have 60 cycles every second. So you go from a positive potential to negative potential back to zero 60 times a second in your household outlet. In Europe, it's typically 50 hertz. And in Japan, it depends on where you live. It could be 50 or 60. So why it's 60 hertz? Why it's 50 hertz? There's different you know, historical reasons for that and why they don't agree, why Europe did differently than the US. We won't get into that. But in the US, almost universally, we're dealing with 60 hertz. The frequency is 60 hertz uh, in your wall outlet. Times the time. So as time changes, as time goes on, as time changes, if the frequency doesn't change, that's 60 hertz out of your wall outlet. The maximum potential doesn't change out of a wall outlet that's 171 or so volts. We'll talk about that in a bit. The potential changes with time. Again, the values here, so B is the potential at time T, V naught is the peak potential. Your book might call these voltages at that time. Again, potential is the proper way of referring to it. Voltage is the unit. F is the frequency of oscillation, and T is time. Now, if the potential is changing with time, remember V equals IR, right? Ohm's law. For a, val a resistance value, it doesn't change with time. So if voltage changes with time, the current must also change with time. So the current changing with time is, again, the same sinusoidal function. You just have a maximum current here. So the current at any time t depends on the maximum current in the circuit times this sinusoidal function. To figure out the maximum current in a circuit, take the maximum voltage divided by the resistance. So what's another distinction between power uh, in an alternating current circuit versus a direct current circuit? Well, recall, power in a circuit is given by the power is equal to the current times the voltage. In a direct current circuit, it's a simple equation. But in an alternating current circuit, it becomes more complex because the current is changing with time, as is the voltage. So if we write that out in an AC circuit, I is really changing with time. So it's some peak current times that sinusoidal function. The voltage also changes with time. It's the peak voltage times some sinusoidal function. It's the same function. So rearranging this algebraically, I pull I and V naught, I naught and V naught together. I have a sine 2 pi FT here. I have a sine 2 pi FT here. When you have two things multiplied together, you square them, right? X times X is equal to X squared. Sine 2 pi FT times sine 2 pi FT is sine squared of 2 pi FT. Well, what happens when you square a sinusoidal function? Well, the sine function, if you remember from uh, geometry and trigonometry, goes between negative one and one, right? It's an, it oscillates between zero, right? Goes past zero, and it's, at its highest, it gets to one, for example, sine of pi, right? or sine of pi over two, sorry, is one. Sine of zero and sine of pi are zero. Sine of three pi over two, or uh, 270 degrees, is minus one. So sine goes between one and minus one. But when you square that, you get rid of all the negative numbers. And it just goes between zero and one. So I plotted that out here, right? The power is I naught V naught. That's still the maximum. This sinusoidal function here, goes between 0 and 1. So if you go down to 0, and it goes all the way up to 1, 1 times I naught V naught is I naught V naught. So that's the maximum power you can possibly have is I naught times V naught, where the current is maximum and the voltage is maximum. But the power can also be 0 at the times where the current and the voltage are 0. So the power is changing with time just like the current and the voltage are. When current is flowing through the circuit at a maximum, at the maximum potential, you get maximum power. When current for an instant is stopped as it reverses direction, no current is flowing through the circuit. The potential is zero at that instant. The power is zero at that instant. So the power is constantly changing with time. That's not incredibly useful. I want to know, in general, how much power is an object using? I can talk about the peak power, but that only tells me what the peak power is. So if I'm trying to get a power estimate, 
that's as, that's as much power as the object can use, but can use less, right? It will every once in a while, right? Periodically, it uses significantly less. It only uses the peak power when it hits those points. So a better way of looking at it is an average. And the average of sine squared, if you average over a full oscillation, is actually one half. So the average power is one half of the peak power. If this sine term averages to one half, then the average power is one half I naught V naught. Because I naught and V naught don't change with time. Those are the maximum values. So the average power for an AC circuit is one half the maximum current times the maximum potential. Well, for a DC circuit, it's just I times V, because those are constants, right? Because the current and the voltage and the potential doesn't change for a DC circuit. But they're two different equations. One has a one-half term in it, the other one doesn't. That's a little confusing. That means that the equation you use depends on if you're using AC or DC current. So what electricians and physicists did was we defined a new term. We define what's called the RMS potential. RMS stands for root mean square. It's the square root of the mean of the square of a set of numbers. So basically what it is is take all of these numbers, square them, take an average, and then take the square root of that average. So the VRMS value, the, the root mean square potential, is equal to the maximum potential over the square root of two. Likewise, the root mean square current is equal to the maximum current over the square root of two. So you can think of the root mean square voltage and the root mean square current as a type of average. It is not a mean, it is not a strict mean. Because if you actually remember in the previous part of this talk, we showed what the current was as a function of time. It looks something like that. Well, the average of this sinusoidal function is zero, right? Because it spends half the time above zero, it spends half the time below zero. So when you average the current of an alternate current circuit, a true mean is zero. A true mean of the voltage is zero. What well, is useless. So we need to come up with a better way of measuring how much voltage goes through, typically goes through an alternating current circuit, how much current typically goes through an alternating current circuit. And that's why we have these root mean square definitions. So when you use a voltmeter or a multimeter on an alternating current circuit, these root mean square values are what the multimeter or the voltmeter measures for you. That's what it spits out. Not the maximum values, the root mean square values. So if we define these terms, then we can say the average power is the root mean square potential times the root mean square current, right? So VRMS times IRMS. Now see how that form of the equation looks a lot more like the form for DC circuits. And likewise, you can use Ohm's law then and rewrite this average power as the VRMS squared over the resistance or as the current RMS squared over the re uh, times the resistance. So the same form of the equations for DC and AC current. But the thing to remember is for alternating current, because the voltages are constantly changing, because the current is constantly changing, the power is constantly changing, what we're doing is we're measuring this root mean square average, if you will. So this gives you an idea of the average value of the voltage, this gives you an idea of the average value of the current in your circuit. Now, alternating current and direct current are two different forms of electricity. Why do we have two forms? Why don't we just pick one or the other? Well, for circuits in computers, we require direct current. The way computer logic circuits work requires, at least the way we have them set up today, requires direct current. So we need direct current to run our computers, to run our phones, to run our digital networks. Analog things that aren't digital, like your analog stove, turn on the stove and you know it heats up, 
or your dishwasher. I'm not talking about the computer in the dishwasher. There has to be a converter in it to, for a computer to work. But the old school stoves in the 1950s and 1960s didn't need digital. There was no digital. Everything was analog. So alternating current circuits worked just fine. And the reason alternating current became very popular over direct current, even though direct current was initially discovered, batteries were discovered before we could generate alternating current circuits uh, uh, using an alternating current generator, is because alternating current is far better at delivering power over long distances. Now, you might have heard of the famous battle between Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla. Thomas Edison, I'm sure you've heard about, you know, famous inventor, um, invented the phonograph, invented the light bulb, invented, you know, a motion picture industry, uh, owed its uh, beginnings to Thomas Edison. And he was a big, huge proponent of direct current. His light bulbs had basically were direct current light bulbs. They, I mean, he patented, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of devices, was a big business mogul. Um, uh, they still call power company in New York Edison, um, Edison Power Company. He had all the patents for direct current. One of his assistants at the time, who he had a falling out with, Nikola Tesla, figured out how to create, easily create what's called alternating current. And the two, and Westinghouse, we might, their TVs made by Westinghouse, it's a power company. Westinghouse bought the patents for Tesla's invention. So Westinghouse and Tesla and Edison basically were battling over who would power the country because electricity was becoming more prominent. The winner ended up being Tesla because alternating current can be can deliver power over large distances and you lose less power. If we wanted to turn everything into direct current, we would need power substations every few miles along a run of power cables incredibly expensive, just prohibitively expensive. Whereas alternating current, you can have high voltage power lines run hundreds of miles, and you might lose 20 or 30% of the power on that line, rather than 99% of the power on that line. So we're stuck with alternating current until we can devise a way of generating, you know, transmitting power over superconducting cables, which don't exist yet. So alternating current, it's generated, delivers power to your home. Most of your devices now, computer devices, transform that alternating current into direct current to use in your laptops, your um, desktop computers, your cell phones, tablets, and so on. 